everybody must be used to Zoom, but if you are not on the top hand side of your screen, you can choose between gallery view or speaker view. With gallery view, you'll see everybody. With speaker view, you'll see only me at this moment or the, the speaker. Because there are several speakers today, you might want to keep it in, in gallery view. Uh, there will be a, a moment for, for your questions. And so if you have any questions during the, during the presentation, uh, you can put your questions on the chat. I'll be paying attention to that and I'll be passing it on to, to Carmen to, to organize how she wants to pass on the, the, the questions. And so uh, more than anything else, I want to welcome you here because it really means a lot to us to, to, to have you all sharing this space with us. A, a, a Black really relies on the, on the support that goes way beyond any financial support, but on, on, on people who come and enjoy our, our events. I see some familiar, familiar faces, which always warms my heart because people are starting to come to, to several of our, our events. And so it's lovely to see Hobioan, Brittany, Coral, Miret, and many of you, all the, the new faces. I, I, I really hope that this is not going to be the only time you're going to come to one of our events. So by registering, you were added to our newsletter, which is a monthly, um, a monthly letter at which you can feel free to unsubscribe at any point, but it's just once a month and a great way to keep up with the things we have been doing. We have several literary events that might interest you and others in music and visual arts, etc. So now I would like to uh, introduce Carmen Rodriguez. Many of you are already familiar with her. Many, I, 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 I would say that I don't know, probably 90% plus of you know Carmen. But for whoever doesn't, Carmen is a long supporter of Black, has been an advisor, a friend, uh, an educator, has a sounding board. Uh, Carmen is a Chilean Canadian bilingual writer, bilingual writer, educator, journalist, and activist, and, and the award winning author of Guerra Prolongada Protracted War, a bilingual volume of poetry, and a body to, re a body to remember, the Puerto Entero, a collection of short stories. In Retribution, El Desquite, Chile's Dotri, a novel. Atacama, a second novel, novel is forthcoming, and um, I believe it's coming this year in the fall, and Carmen will be able to, to confirm that. So over to you, Carmen. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. A pleasure to see everybody. <clears throat> Many good friends. Um, and thank you, Lily, and thank you, Bilad, for sponsoring this uh, panel discussion that promises to be dynamite. Uh, I'm very honored and pleased to be in the company of our, my friends, Ava Homa, Alejandro Saravia, Ana Maria Sewell. We were just talking about how, in addition to our writing and our activism, um, we're connected through the Writers' Union of Canada. We have all served on the board on the, on the National Council of the, of the Union. Uh, and Alejandro is actually serving there now. So that's a very important connection for all of us. Um, <clears throat> to write is to resist. To write is to recreate. Eduardo Galeano, the Uruguayan writer, said in 1976, in an incarcerated society, free literature can only exist as denunciation and hope. If we were to envision today's society as a gigantic prison, who would be our jailers? Undoubtedly the same ones that Galliano exposed and denounced. Capitalism, 
colonialism, imperialism, and white patriarchy. These are the forces that for centuries have dominated the world, created profound economic and social inequities, and now threaten to destroy our planet. In their writing, Ana Marie Sewell, Alejandro Saravia, and Ava Homa unmask and decry these forces and the impact they have had on the earth and on people's lives. Cultural genocide, state repression, systemic racism, displacement, and the pillage of natural resources, just to name a few. But in doing so, these writers also chart journeys of human dignity, of courage, love of life, beauty, and activism. Theirs is the literature of denunciation and hope. For them to write is to resist and to write is to recreate. I'm going to invite first Ana Maria Sewell to speak to these issues from the perspective of her as a person and as a writer. Ana Maria Sewell is a poet and performer who was born in Fredericton, New Brunswick. She's of Mi'kmaq, Anishinaabe, and Polish heritage. She's the author of poetry collections, more recently for The Changing Moon, Poems and Songs, and most recently of a novel called Humane. She was poet laureate of Edmonton, Alberta, where she resides. And also she is on the editorial board of Write Magazine, which is the publication of the Writers' Union of Canada. Welcome, Ana Marie, amiga, adelante. She speaks Spanish. <laughs> Pues, más o menos, y me gusta tanto estar aquí con, contigo, Carmen, y con todos ustedes. People of such wonder and glory, thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, as I was taught to do, I'll tell you who I am and where I'm from. I'm the silence between two rivers, and the rivers that I come from are from my father's side, Anishinaabe and Mi'kmaq. I belong legally to Listaguch Mi'kmaq First Nation in Gisbebeguac, Mawiomi, on the northern coast of um, New Brunswick and the southern coast of Quebec. But I belong as much to Alberta, which is where I've lived most of my life. And my father's people hold matrilineal descent to matter. So for them, I'm born to my mother, who is the daughter of Polish immigrants. Uh, my Polish family are patrilineal. So for them, I am born to my father's people. And so I'm in the perfect place to be a writer in between things, some of each, neither of anything. And it's been quite a challenge to think in preparation for this evening about what it is that I resist and what it is that I seek to recreate as a writer. I lack the background of our esteemed compañero Eduardo Galeano. Until the preparation for this night, in fact, I'd never read Galeano. Reading him is a monumental task and he has analysis that's far beyond what I do. I'm just a writer and a gardener and a ponderer after strange things. That's all I do. But what do I resist? Above all else, I would say I resist extinction and despair. Those are things I don't have any time for. I resist also easy categorization. In this moment in time, I do believe it is a thing we must all do. We are pressured and encouraged, or at least I certainly feel that way, to narrow down and be more specific about which categories we would like to belong to. And encouraged then to 
categorize others and separate ourselves out from them. When I was a young girl, it mattered to stand up and be indigenous and to say, yes, we are Ojibwe. Yes, we are Mi'kmaq. That's our family you're talking about. When my same age neighbors were being told to pretend you're French, pretend you're Italian, pretend you're Spanish, at least if you're not good enough, you're not that worst thing, an Indian. When I became an adult, I realized that in certain quarters of Indigenous Canada, it's worse than an Indian to be a half-breed. So it cuts both ways. And I had become so inured to telling people to back off when they told me to pretend not to be Indigenous, that when Indigenous people came and said, don't talk about being white, my hillbilly instincts kicked in and I went, nope, but I am. I am all those things. And I think we must all embrace our full humanity if we're going to do anything useful in the world. That's how it is for me anyway. And that's what I like to write about. And I'll start with a prayer. I don't want to speechify as much as I'd like to read some writing to you. This is from my first book, Fifth World Drum, which is a 2009 book. And it talks about my idea that as a person of the fourth world, the indigenous world, I must be looking towards fifth world, which is the one that we're going to make that we're all blending together in this crucible of time. That's what I think is important. And here's my journey prayer. Enough light for the journey and breath enough. Enough fire for the journey and love enough. Enough road for the journey and will enough. And all along the way to hear the song that you are, that we are. I'm currently working with a choral composer who has a taken an expanded text that I wrote of that and we're making a performance out of it. It's quite a lot of fun singing with a bunch of people. I think that's one of the things we can raise in this moment is our voices together however we do that. We're rehearsing online, which I've never done before, but you know, we're endlessly adaptable if we wish to be. And that's what I seek to recreate too, is a sense of the coherence of adapting that against the forces that would tell us to separate, to further delineate, to back into a corner and disengage with the complexity of the world. Against that, I hold up the notion that it's really important to open your door and understand it's a great mystery and it's far more complicated than we can ever get hold of. So we may as well relax and just try to live with that. That's enough to do in and of itself. So my first novel is about people like me, people like the people I grew up with, people who are the products of globalization, but who are too busy living to really spend their time talking too much about it. They have too much to do to try to keep things together for themselves and their families. Nonetheless, <coughs> we are deeply involved in doing things that make a difference. So the narrator, Hazel Lissage, lives in Amasquachi, which is a city not unlike Edmonton, Alberta, um, but its name's been changed to protect the memory of Amasquachi. And I just want to say as an aside, I'm very happy to say that Edmonton itself has just gone to a new system of ward naming where we've given Indigenous names to the 12 wards of the city. And I think it can't be too far behind that we seriously consider renaming Edmonton Amasquachi, which is its older name, because it's a much cooler name, I would say, much more interesting. There's no other Amasquachi Waskagan in the world, and there's no other word that sounds as beautiful and as specifically here as that. So in Hazel's world, that has happened. A whole lot of other things have happened too. And she is accidentally working as a detective. It's not her field of endeavor. It's not something she was ever interested in. She raised her two daughters. They're doing fine. They're out in the world doing more than she is. But when people ask her for help, even though she doesn't want to, she helps them. 
so I've got a dog now and I've got a case. Did I mention that I work as a detective? It seems like a stupid job sometimes, even to me, and it's my job. Actually, I trained as a transcriptionist, first for medical records, then for court records, then I put myself through school doing that. And I'll tell you what, even though so much has changed in Namaskwachi, too much still hasn't. Even in a brown city where globalization shows on most of the faces if you're paying attention, even here, there's still no balance. Still too many indigenous faces in the lineups, in the poverty wards, or just dead. Too many stories, too tediously the same. And transcribing them was not changing a damn thing. But detective, I might be actually bone stupid to think I could do any more good as a detective. I guess it's a good thing Big Frankie is dead and can't snark at me about what kind of a sensible person goes in for detective. Frankie was always full of ideas about how I could live my life better. <sighs> Too bad his own life ran out on him, eh? Fuck, whatever. He's gone. And I don't hang around that Sandra. Nope, why give her the chance to pick up picking where Frankie left off? What matters is... I've so far resisted the weird urge to take the dog to work with me. I can get used to him paddling around the house like he owns it, but my office is mine. And I sit in my office and I deal the cards and I let my thoughts sort themselves out while I challenge the deck. Solitaire, real cards, the slip and click of them as comforting as the oldest memories. Mom in the kitchen dealing. She called it patience, not my strong suit patience, but somehow dealing the cards, I can sink into my hind mind and mull. So far to no avail. Who killed Nell August? It seems simple, but it's not. The cops reported she was known to them in a high risk lifestyle, i.e. she's a hooker and their inquiries have led nowhere. And they have more cases every day, and so cursory inquiries leading exactly nowhere. Very sorry, August family, we can't give you more closure than that. To the cops, the subtext goes, it's a story as old as the streets, and the ending is just what it is. I don't know why, but there's something about that doesn't sit right with me. Shit, I don't even like the Augusts, if I'm honest. They're not nice people. It's too obvious the way their own dysfunctions contributed to Nell's bad ending. So it's not for Delphine August's whiny sake that I'm still doing this, and it's not for the money. She can barely afford my fees. Her whining about that was almost enough to make me turn down the case, if I'm honest. Fucking victim queen. Boo-hoo, she can't afford more. I saw the truck they drove up in. And I figure they're not the poor resbillies they portray. I don't care about that, really. It's not my problem if they're assholes who figure it's their right to screw people by playing the old stereotype for all it's worth. Maybe they do have scores to settle. Maybe I do the same in their shoes. But I like to think I wouldn't pull that shit on a person who is also Indigenous. Even if I am part Slav and not about to pretend I'm not, I clearly am not the oppressive overlord system, me in my crappy office with my beater <laughs> Jeep and my salmon colored house in a cheap part of town. And I'm bragging, not complaining. I'm okay with what I've made in my life so far. History is rough for a lot of us. It's old and I don't give a shit about it. I barely give a shit about this case. Psh. Why do I care? I care so much that I bruised myself, thrashing the tree, wound up into a visionary state, and on my dead grandma's visionary advice, stole a dog who, it turns out, can talk to me telepathically. Which, although it is oddly satisfying to have this physical evidence, this actual proof, as the Nichiren Buddhists say, of our animist indigenous perspective that recognizes soul and sentience far beyond the human, which does me exactly zero good in trying to solve this case. But I work the deck into order and I know I'll keep on sifting the deck of facts on Nell August's murder. For sure, no one else is gonna to try to. And honestly, it's at least one small hit back at that steamroller history of girls, women, boys, throwaway people, gone with no accounting. 
Why haven't we been able to stop throwing away our own? Yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Anna Marie. Mm -hmm. I would like to invite Ava next. Um, Ava Homa is Kurdish, and she's the first Kurdish woman to publish a novel in English. Uh, her debut novel, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, which came out uh, recently in 2020. She's a journalist and an activist and holds cinema in English and creative writing from the University of Windsor. Her collection of short stories, Echoes from the Other Land, was nominated for the Frank O'Connor International Prize and she is the inaugural recipient of the Penn Canada Humber College Writers in Exile Scholarship. I would like to suggest that um, other than Ava, who's going to be speaking now, if we all, the rest of us all mute ourselves. Thank you. Ava. Thank you so much, Carmen. I would like to start by thanking the organizers. Um, of the Vancouver Latin American Cultural Center. Carmen, thank you so much for putting this amazing event together. Um, I'm so happy to see familiar faces here. So thanks my friends for showing up, Judy, Heather, Gail. Um, so yeah, thanks to everyone for making the time to be here with us today and listen to our stories of writing and resisting and uh, finding that really delicate interconnection between literature and activism and thinking about the power of storytelling and how that can help us in reshaping our world into at least moving towards a world where we won't we will no longer have on people and voiceless people and people whose lives we don't grieve and people whose voices we never hear. Um, I came of age in the Kurdish region of Iran and I learned really early on that me just being alive, just breathing was an act of subversion. Partly because of my gender in Iran, being a woman is pretty much a crime. You can't really get married, get a job, leave the country, travel, um, get divorced without a man's permission. That man is initially your father and later your husband. Um, worse than everything, women don't even have custody to their children. I mean, there are specific conditions and exceptions and not every person takes advantage of these brutal laws but uh, mm -hmm. we're talking about we like to, to, to see ourselves as belonging to one race this human race but some of us do live in conditions where our humanity is denied on a daily basis but in addition to being a woman in Iran I also belong to this Kurdish minority where we have been targeted for annihilation repeatedly over the century so if you've been subject to genocide, you've been subject to cultural genocide, and you still come out and say, I belong to this uh, nation, that in itself, just your identity could be an act of resistance, even though at one point I realized that's not enough. Now, when this Kurdish history started, it, you can say it really started at the end of the First World War, where the Allies sat down and decided how to divide their spoils of war because we were not humans, we were just their spoils of war. So Britain and France decided and smoked their uh, cigars and drank their champagnes and argued over how to divide our lands. And in 1930, there was this treaty which promised to curse their own land. And two years later, another treaty was signed back by the United States where the Kurds were denied their own country because why would Kurds need a country? They're not very docile. It's not really in um, colonial Brits' interest if these people can have their own country. And then ever since the Kurdish land was divided between these four countries of Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria, we were no longer on the map. The, 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 pre, the free World War atlases show Kurdistan, but no longer after that. And just like that, we have been subject to 100 years of uh, really brutal attacks by all these four countries uh, from the 1937 to 1938 Dersin massacre in the hands of the Kurdish Turkish government to their 90s, 1990s attack of uh, villages, 
to Saddam Hussein's 1986 to 88 uh, two year unfall genocide, to the ongoing executions of, in Iran. As we speak, there are so many intellectuals and writers are languishing on death row in Iran, and a lot of times their crimes is muharabe, enmity with God. That's how people are being um, sent to their death rows. Um, so I was raised with a lot of hushed stories, not things that were um, spoken out loud, but these hushed stories of massacres and how we survived them, how state soldiers, even volunteer militia, came to our cities, to our villages. They killed us, they more than killed us. They gassed us, they tortured our villages, they raped our women, they shot fathers before the white eyes of their children, and so much more. And those of us who survived the phys physical erasure of our lives now had to face cultural destruction. The states that rule over us, the, like any oppressors in the world, because oppressors are really original in their approach, they first try to deny you, deny your very existence, right? So Turkey calls for mountain Turks. So you're not, an, an, as an independent, distinct group of people, you're just Turks, but you're really less than us because you're just mountain Turks. Iran called us Mufsid fil Ars. It's a religious government, so it uses a lot of Arabic terms. They call those corruptors on earth, and um, Khomeini had his fatwa of uh, his verdict for jihad against us. And anyone who fights back this state aggression is obviously called a terrorist. Now, Kurdish women fight um, ethnic subjugation alongside their men and patriarchy alone. So Kurdish women are dealing with the uh, national chauvinism of the states ruling us, but also male chauvinism of our own culture, as well as uh, Islamic groups, misogynistic laws, mm -hmm. uh, war, poverty, and so on and so forth. As Kurdish parents try to protect their children in this annihilate or assimilate policies, uh, we gradually lost parts of our heritage and identity, and we developed this cognitive dissonance between generations where communication has become more and more impossible. Um, so as we were, we continued being denied and defined, we, we were reduced to subhumans in ways that really shattered our pride and dig dignity and identity. However, in spite of, if not because of all of this, we have become masters of rising from our ashes. Our statelessness has killed us, but it has also has taught us how to uh, res resurrect. Um, it's no wonder that our most common uh, motto is Berhodan Jiana, resistance is life. So resistance is not something you do for now and then you put it on hold and go get busy with paying bills and taking your pills. It's something you do with your breath, by your writing, by by standing up for justice, by talking, by not accepting their denial and their definition of you. So as I yearned for freedom, I looked for ways that I could extricate myself from this state that wasn't really mine. It was never my country. So, but in order to find some sort of a redemptive world to make meaning and also to resist, I relied on literature. I didn't have many other options in life, but I'm so glad that I lived in a family where books were everywhere in every room, and I was able to find purpose and shelter in uh, literary fiction specifically. So literature has been my refuge, it has been my support, um, but my search to find myself in it completely proved futile. Um, I searched for my reflection in Persian literature, in uh, world literature written in English, um, and I could never see another Kurdish woman in there. I realized that no one has written Kurdish women into literature and that this is something we have to do, that I have to do. Um, luckily, I won a scholarship and I moved to Canada to University of Windsor when I earned, where I earned my second master's degree this time in creative writing at Windsor, and that's how my years of writing in exile began. Um, writing in exile is not as dangerous as writing in Iran. Nobody holds a gun to my head because of what I write. But in Canada, it's so easy for me to be overlooked. Sometimes it's outright out of ignorance and bias and malice. 
But sometimes it's really that because people don't know me, they don't know who Kurds are, it's so easy for them to slip. Like if there's one writer they have to forget, it's the Kurdish writer because they can connect, make connection. It doesn't mean too much to them. And so I had to realize where I am and how I'm going to do as now that I am in the safety of Canada and how I can redefine myself as, um, as a migrant, as a stateless, as an exile writer and what I can do in order to balance uh, writing with survival as an immigrant in a country where I have to start from the scratch, not only in terms of building a career and all of that, but also in terms of just really understanding who I am. Um, before I found out why I was writing, it was really hard for me to stomach all the rejection or racism that I faced, but um, it's been a while that I realized that my life work stands at this empowering intersection of literature and activism. I believe in the power of storytelling and creative work to create compassion. And then I'm very eager to help turn that compassion into action. But for now, I just think we need to continue reading each other because when we do read each other, we're less likely to get into wars, to have hatred and um, ignorance. So Daughters of Smoke and Fire is the story of Leila and Chia, a sibling that grew up in the Kurdish region of Iran. Their father is an activist. Um, Chia really wants to become a human rights lawyer. He, he loves to take the perpetrators against Kurdish genocide into an international criminal court. And Leila is a filmmaker, and she's interested in taking her people's story to the stage. But one day, Chia disappears while he's protesting in Tehran, and now it's Leila's job to try and save him. And while she's doing that, she puts her own life also in danger. I'm going to read two pages of the novel for you. And this is where um, Leila and Chia's father, whom they call Baba, Baba is uh, the country's father, isn't really willing to share much of uh, what he went through as an activist, the genocide that he witnessed as a young kid and his, I, his life in prison and the torture that affected him and reshaped him. But there's this one night when there, Leila and her father are alone and they start cooking and then he finally and for the first time ever opens up. That night, Baba did not turn on the television or radio. Instead, perhaps inspired by my soup, he went out and shortly after came back with bags of groceries. He taught me how to make a mouth-watering dish of ground lamb, celery, carrots, eggplant, potato, and tomato sauce. We substituted lentils for the ground lamb. Did you really know? Did you know why they call this food maladis? He blew on a steamy spoonful. Maladis, meaning a clergy would steal it? No, why is that? They say if something is good, it will be immediately stolen either by the police or the mullahs. I laughed. It's sad. He looked at me with surprise and tasted the food. I know, but I like these little acts of rebellion, naming a food that way. His taste test burned his tongue. I chortled louder. He threw his head back with glee, showing the empty space where his molars should be. The food was ready. We relished every spoonful. Another teenager was tortured to death today. Only 15. Flash for cursing at the Supreme Leader, he said. It was a taste. It was a test, but I didn't take the bait. I redirected. How did you learn this recipe from grandma? Everything she made was unmatchable, he lamented. She was a saint. Every time I had a nightmare, she was there, ready to soothe me back to sleep. Oh, you had a lot of nightmares too as a child? I had no idea. Baba told me he had witnessed a massacre when he was seven and how the murderous frenzy of the soldiers still haunted him with rejuvenated potency in scenes that shifted from a mute black and white motion picture to colorful three-dimensional real life experience. Chia and I had grown up hearing whispers about that day, the day that had defined my father forever. It was his inheritance, his agony, and I longed to share in his burden, if only to understand what had led him down his path of activism 
to the imprisonment that was still a chain on our family. It's been only seven. Baba swallowed, saying as of the day. Instead, he shared how he still relived it some night. In the nightmares, he was there again, a horrified witness to the parents' shrieks and plea, the soldiers' mirth, the growl of the deadly tanks, the prisoners' silent tears. Raising his eyes to the sky, Baba would beg for divine intervention, for an end to the cruelty. Instead, he'd find himself in a hole buried up to his chin, at once a terrified spectator and a panicked captive. He would wait for God to pay attention. He would wait until there was no more waiting to be done, and the threat of the tank was upon him. As the tanks rolled in, his inability to scream would awaken him. Grandma would then emerge with a calming hand in a sky blue dress looking like a fairy who had entered through the window. Outside, a truck's tire crushed the snow. Stunned, I studied Baba's stoic face. I swallowed, wanting to say something, but I didn't know what. That he was a gifted storyteller that I understood him well because I also suffered even though my exposure to genocide and incarceration was secondhand. In fact, that was the problem. My imprisonment and motherlessness was figurative, his literal. Did you have that nightmare in prison too? I finally asked. I summoned patience until he spoke. Ordinarily, a morning interrogation would be followed by a flogging in the basement, he told me. But one day, his guard was called upstairs and Baba had to follow. Baba raised his bruised face as they climbed the stairs. He then saw a row of hanged prisoners framed by the window that opened onto the prison courtyard. Hearing of execution is one thing, but seeing those limp hooded bodies he couldn't finish his sentence. Baba saw before him his martyred brothers, uncles and friends, swaying slowly in the breeze, their heads tilted to one side, ropes snug around their broken necks, hands and feet bound tightly together as if they were hanging from the sky itself. The guard pulled Baba along and before he really knew what was happening, he had shoved the soldier against the wall, kneeing him in the groin with all his strength. The guard collapsed, but others swarmed Baba, raining down blows. When they were done, he was thrown into a solitary cell. That was when Baba, who until then had been the quietest and most introverted of the inmates, started beating his bloody head against the wall. As punishment, he was kept longer still in isolation. His tiny cell had no ventilation. For months, he sat alone and picked up the scraps of the plaster that fell from the ceiling. I bit the insides of my cheeks to swallow down my tears. Sitting across the dinner table was a man who had paid a massive price for hoping and trying for a just world, who had fathered and then neglected me, who wasn't aware that the rage he harbored had killed all other impulses in him, chewing at the core of his compassion before spitting it back out. And here I was, sliding down a similar inevitable path. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ava. Where's Alejandro? Alejandro, oh, where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. Alejandro Saravia is a trilingual poet, short story writer, and novelist, originally from Cochabamba, Bolivia, and he has lived in Quebec since 1986. He's the author of half a dozen books of poetry, one collection of short stories, and a novel red, yellow, green, which won the John Glasgow Translation Prize in 2018. He's a member of the editorial collective of The Apostles Review, a Montreal-based semi-annual literary publication, 
and serves currently on the National Council of the Writers' Union of Canada. Alejandro, bienvenido. Muchas gracias, Carmen. Thank you very much for this, uh, for hosting this event. And uh, thank you for connecting the East and West parts of the country. So in that sense, I think that uh, uh, the, you are Latinos in Vancouver are kind of uh, the train connecting one point of the country to the other. Uh, I come from Bolivia. I was born in Bolivia and uh, as many as the whole history of Canada, immigrants come not because they want to leave the countries. Uh, you can just think about the Irish or the Spaniards that came after the, the civil war in Spain. So uh, you know what happened in Latin America. So I will not uh, dwell too much into that. But one thing I must say, and I think that uh, if we would have the time machine and we choose any time in history from 5,000 years ago under the rule of uh, the pharaohs in Egypt to the Roman Empire in the first centuries of our time to any time, I don't think there's a time in history in which there hasn't been a situation of oppression, of violence, of repressions, of people being disappeared. I was just uh, thinking about uh, how we are, we have been intellectually, we have been educated with the, uh, within the Greco-Latin Judeo-Christian traditions and histories. And uh, just uh, think of uh, Arminius, that uh, he was the barbarian for the Romans. And in, uh, uh, there's these horrendous massacres in, in, in the Roman Empire, but also a book that was discovered in 1987 is by Juan de Betanzos, and he writes about the history of the uh, of the Quechua, the Incas. And uh, in that book, you see how there's this, in this empire that had about between 12 to 60 million people, people, one side of the, uh, one side would be with Huascar, and the other side with Atahualpa, and they will just, uh, chase one another, battles with, with 30,000 dead. Uh, the victorious uh, forces will enter a city and will kill everyone in the city. Uh, so if we were all Egyptians, we'll be just angry against the pharaohs, or we will be uh, Latinos, I mean, the real Latinos in Rome, will be plotting against the Caesar. So uh, I, I, in that sense, I, I I think that uh, what we have to do in life is just to choose what to do in that within that within that framework. I'm going to read a few texts, three texts actually, that are available. And one is is this one is Lon Polyphonique, uh, and um, the text that I'm going to read is called uh, "In Praise of Struggle," which is basically a bit of what we have to confront when we come to another country. It says, um, so late we came to be born anew, 10, 20 years later, dragging our bodies through bus stations, airplanes, international borders, and facing cold eye immigration agents, songs, pictures in our hearts, the sand castles of our memories, eroded by the blowing northern winds, crushed under the weight of fresh snow. We are so late in our lives to start speaking new languages, so far from home, 20 years of words that we never pronounced, names of streets, customs and faces to be placed on the maps of our new lives. So we fight the devil of time with one hand tied up behind the back, dancing on one foot, whistling all songs to ally the fear of defeat, singing for the strength of 
and inspiration to come. You fall again, you nurse your wounds, relishing despite everything, the honor embodied in the struggle. Where is home now? It is no longer on the maps. It lives in the act of raising your body from the ground again, lifting your spirit to keep dancing with the devil, taking away from him cities and languages, borders and soldiers in this exhausted world. The ruin of the planet might be his work. Yours is the magnificence of raising your head from the mud again, the battle drum of your heart, the medicine of your languages. Once more, your muscles tense in the effort, your beaten flesh standing up again, for you have been living without knowing for the clean fight, the beauty of the struggle. Uh, when I came to Canada, uh, what struck me was um, how uh, much um, these lines of connections with my own culture, with our cultures in, in the Americas, because we all come from indigenous roots. And um, when you travel to Winnipeg, when you go to the reserves, when you go to to uh, to the north north part of of the country, like Ihaluit in Nunavut, you see the resemblance, the, the the community that you you have when you compare your your mythologies. When you see that here we have uh, the raven, the trickster, as the one who. Uh, is teasing humanity to, to become better, to tell, telling you stories. And uh, also um, that in turn forced you to look back to your country and to realize that you have been, you, you, you have been living in, a, in a, one of the most racist societies in which even to until a year ago, the president of the country, the de facto president of the country will refer to indigenous people as savages, uh, where uh, this, the, the country has been living a de facto apartheid for over almost 200 years, where uh, there's this, um, this colonial embodiment of how we see the other. And, you know, in this context, uh, the Métis uh, who speak Spanish uh, have this uh, are so the, the ignorance is so profound that they do not consider for a second that they are speaking with people that speak two languages, and those languages are seven thousand years old. I'm speaking about the Aymara, and uh, and then we have this democracy that we have here, as if it were the the best uh, way of living together, when. Uh, we study uh, the history of of, uh, of 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 the world. You see that democracy, invented by the Greeks, uh, poorly applied in our context because it has uh, relegated one vote. Because in in Greece, in the in, when democracy was invented, there was also a vote not just for the one to be in power, but also it was elected the citizen. Who would be the most dangerous for the for the for the country, for the city, for the republic, and that person, the elected person, was was uh, expelled for ten years for the safety of the country. So uh, we come from people from from societies that uh, have lived, have found ways to live together in in a, in a complex societies, but we know nothing about how that worked, what forms of, of collective participation they have. And so that is what I, I found here. And also um, when I think of racism, uh, when I think of patriarchy and, patriarchy and, uh, and colonialism, I see that in, our, in, in, our, in this society, in our society, I live in a province in which the, the prime minister refuses to recognize that there is, there is systemic racism. Um, where uh, there's this um, double language in which we want a world without uh, 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 without oil, yet at the same time 
we have a government that is investing our money buying oil companies. So, um, one, so what I saw in Bolivia, the violence that I saw in Bolivia uh, had accompanied me throughout, uh, it, once that you are marked by violence, it never leaves you, it's always there. And uh, uh, one thing that I did is that I wanted to get rid of the, the idea of the country. And I think that it was uh, that the reason why I wrote uh, uh, a novel, Red, Yellow, and Green, where um, precisely there's a moment in which uh, there's this encounter between uh, a, a person who has a country, Bolivia, and who doesn't want to have a country. And there he, in, in Montreal, he meets a woman, a Kurdish woman who wants to have a country and whose name is actually Bolivia. So this is this fragment in which they meet. Um, three years had passed since he had set out daily to write his long, dense novel in which he would peel one layer at a time with the diligence of an ant, the intestines of his, of, uh, of his patria, of his homeland, which like Goya's monstrous, insatiable Saturn at the El Prado Museum, devoured her, her own, his own children, chewing on them slowly as if they were coca culicus. He would thus attempt to demonstrate that the main reason for Bolivia's existence was violence. During every Montreal winter, the sky robbed in the bright light blue of thin giant sheet of aluminium. He hadn't stopped turning the dial on his shortwave radio, all in vain. Eventually, Bolivia started to resemble a sort of a Camelot, a mythical kingdom he would never again be allowed to enter. For a long time, he collected newspapers and cut out news articles. He tried to rekindle a few friendships by writing letters that were never answered. He became enraged and got drunk uttering curses in three languages and insults in two other after learning about the final results of the 1993 national elections in which a former dictator was elected president. In a stubborn silent act of protest, Alfredo went to an oil liquidation store on Boulevard Saint Laurent and bought a pair of cotton polyester socks with the colors of the Bolivian flag red, yellow, and green. He wore them as a provocative act, or at least he thought foolishly picturing himself baited in the perfume of subversion and conspiracy under a pair of ankle length pants. He then went to every Latin American party he learned about on posters copied and taped in corners around the immigrant neighborhood of Cotenage at cafes on hedonistic Rue Saint-Denis, along the Cosmopolitan Boulevard Saint Laurent, on bus stops. On a Saturday evening, filled with tamales and revelry at a solidarity event for a group of persecuted Aboriginal Guatemalans who had spent centuries dodging the muskets or infrared scopes of soldiers from the Imperio, a woman with long black hair and eyes of gray coral thought that she had recognized the political manifesto implied by his three color socks. She walked up to him cautiously at first, showing growing interest in him, a man who rather than reserve was linguistically shy. She spoke to him in French with an accent that at times seemed from Marseille. Spontaneously, she told him about her Kurdish origins, the goals of the Kurdish cause, her experiences in France and Germany, where she had been recently been working as a, as a translator, establishing contacts and working for the PKK, Kurdistan's Workers' Party, which was fighting on two fronts against oppression from Turkey and Iraq, and had recently unleashed a mighty wave of bombing 
against various Turkish embassies and consulates across Europe to highlight the silent complicity between Turkish and Europeans, former rivals now united in the subjugation of the Kurdish people. She didn't have a patria, but dream of having one, while Alfredo had one, but dream of not having it. To make matters worse, both countries, one more imaginary than the other, bore the same three colors on their flags. So Alfredo tried to make himself understood over the trumpeting salsa and merengue and the hypnotic aroma of patacones, tamales, and chorizo around them. In his Cochabamba French, he explained the true meaning of his socks, the subversive effect that he intended, his vigorous categorical rejection of his nation's flag that infamous, insignificant, blood-stained rug that to him represented the most primitive nationalism. In that church basement in Cotonej, the fire of his rhetoric, all the rivers of his Andean memories, his best French verb conjugations were all useless in convincing her of the real purpose of his tricolor socks. She smiled at Sir him, amused perhaps by the French accent of this man, Alfred cette fois, ou Alfred avec une air profonde et riche, or perhaps by the crude naivete of his explanations. For her, from the perspective of Komala Karjaren, the Kurdish trade union movement, Alfredo Sox represented the colors of the great Kurdish patria and the road to that promised land inexorably passed through the barrel of a rifle and the gunpowder of a bomb. Who knows if it was because they were tired of geopolitical and socio-historical re reasoning or the music that had invaded all their pores, but suddenly they both realized their bodies began a dialogue with each other in the oldest and most silent language on earth. So that is the moment in which you have this, this struggle between having a homeland and not wanting a homeland and the other person wanting a homeland. And all this, um, I'm saying this now, we are in 2021, the struggle continues on. Um, and we are in this part, although in 2015, uh, Justin Trudeau said that Canada perhaps is the first post-national country, we are still in this, uh, in this struggle of, uh, of uh, finding the ways to express a better society that does not fall into the trap of ethno-nationalism, which we sometimes feel in Quebec in certain voices, and uh, the need also to be who we are and not this this faceless mass of consumers that the system wants us to become. So writing is basically, the purpose of writing is to give your sense to the world, give your version of the world. So in that way, you stop being a, just a mere consumer, a Netflix consumer in basement. And also recreating is to try to find what was done best or better in other societies and what can be done um, with, with other people. But literature is not the space to fight for that. It, we cannot ask literature to, to change history or change society, but literature writing by the fact that it forms, it helps us to imagine things together can change things. I'm losing my voice now. Wow. Lots of uh, themes that come out of this discussion. And basically, what is the role of literature, right, in this uh, fractious, uh, unequal, um, violent, society that we live in, live in, and that, as Alejandro said, has been the reality for really thousands of years. 
um, even when we look back and, and try to uh, idealize uh, certain societies like the Inca, right? Uh, but actually it was a fierce uh, empire where the, the, that quest for power, you know, uh, turned into, into terrible violence. So extinction, categorization, right? Uh, div division of, uh, of uh, people into little categories, into little boxes um, with all this identity stuff that is happening, has been happening, right? Uh, for, for so long now, which um, of course has uh, important roots and has, uh, and is, uh, it is completely justifiable, but at the same time, how does it divide us instead of bringing us together? Uh, living, just the act of living as subversion, you know, when, when a whole uh, people uh, is, when there are attempts to exterminate a whole people, just the act of living becomes subversive and becomes an act of resistance. Resistance as a way of life, not as something that you do for a period of time and then you forget about it, but resistance, right? As, as a daily thing, resisting assimilation, resisting uh, genocide, right? Resi resisting um, erasure. Literature and activism, you know, Ava brought up the, uh, the issue of where, where is that fine line that uh, divides literature from activism. Is there a division? Is there a continuum? You know, and Alejandro claims uh, literature cannot change things, but it can bring people together so that things can be changed uh, as part of that process. Um, the idea of the country and of, of nationalism, right? Where does that come in? Um, Canada as a country. Uh, we are uh, a multi-linguistic uh, cultural country where uh, there is an insistence from the uh, powers that be to uh, talk about a bilingual country. Um, and that's it, right? What happens to all the other languages that are spoken, including the Aboriginal languages and all the the, uh, the languages that we immigrants have brought in to this country, languages that have rich, rich, a, a wealth of, uh, of uh, history in terms of literature, in terms of art, in terms of uh, the contributions that we can all make to this society, but we are all separated into our little cubicles because no, this is a bilingual country only, right? So lots of, uh, lots of uh, fodder for conversation. And um, I would like to ask uh, Anna Marie, when you said um, that in a way your writing and your, uh, your practice um, wants to defy categorization while at the same time uh, it's important for you to state who you are or where you come from. At the same time, categorization seems to be uh, something that you do not wish to insist on. I don't know if that's the way you said it, but that's the way I understood it. Yeah, that's so. I need to identify myself because that's what we do traditionally but also because at this moment in time the latest trick that indigenous folks get to live with is that the pendulum of how cool we are or not has swung from Italian or tend 
Namari, you seem to be frozen. Are other people also perceiving that she's kind of frozen? Okay, I don't know if the connection maybe is not. Yeah, how about now? Now, good. Yes. Yeah, I just took my video off. Sorry, it's my bandwidth problem. Okay. I was just saying that in Indigenous circles, as I witness things when I was young, it was a fearsome thing to say openly that we were Indigenous and I grew up in a family who were very fiercely proud of that with a lot of people around us who pretended to be French, Spanish, Italian. Now we see in Indigenous arts and literature people pretending to be Indians because it's got a certain cultural cachet and so it's become a strange thing to be a middle-aged woman and to have young hot activists coming at me and at people of my generation demanding that we declare our family affiliations and do it right and do it in our languages and to have to become the old timer and i'm not that old yet who says well actually as maria campbell once said in a beautiful presentation in about 1998 I'm speaking to you in English, and that's not my fault. That's our history. And we have to accept our history and move from it. I don't want to be half of anything. I don't want to be belonging to a category where my identity is my worth as a writer. My worth as a writer and I think the worth of any writer is what can I help us to record as a society? What moment can I capture that helps us as a collective, anyone who engages with it to say, ah, yes, this is where we are. And this is where that might lead. The better to choose which direction to go. I think writers are there to point at the future. We may look and outline the past and we may speak of the but it is our job to point towards the future and i'm all for a future where we survive as a species and become once again better enmeshed in relationship to the fellow travelers who share this world we're just one species and if i know anything it's that we act like a bunch of toddlers most of the time um, compared to how we could act in relationship with the rest of the world. And I want to get to that relating and, and be done with all this arguing amongst ourselves. We have real work to do to reestablish harmony with this world. And that's the work I want to do in my, in my writing. Does that make more sense to what I said? Definitely. Alejandro or Ava, do you want to comment? or add? I'll comment after Abba. Well, I really enjoyed listening to what um, uh, Anna Marie said. I just wanted to clarify that I don't, I never advocate for literature as activism because I don't believe that literature could, should any, I think the worst thing you can do to literature is make it didactic. But I think of literature and activism, not as activism. So if you, do read a powerful story about a group of people you never heard of. And then the next question in your head is, so what do I do now? That's when an activist comes and says, here's a petition you can sign. Here's a sample of a template letter you can send to your representative to stop the genocide that is at now. I mean, um, for Kurds, I mean, it's, um, I would have rather not lived in a nation state world, but now that we do, now that in just in 2019, Trump randomly, after a phone call with Erdogan of Turkey, decides to pull American troops and leaves Kurds to the mercy of um, Turkey. And when in 2014, Yazidi Kurds are attacked and kidnapped and taken as sex slaves, I can't really sit here and romanticize um, statelessness when I know the price we pay firsthand for it as we speak now today. And it's not just the attack and the physical erasure. I mean, if you look for Kurdish women in 
Middle Eastern studies and European studies and academic studies even, you cannot find them. So I can't even begin to explain how massive the price is that you pay for not having a state in a nation state age, not in, in an ideal world. But I loved what Anna-Marie said at the end of the day, the goal is this human connection. Really what we need is this heart to heart resuscitation, right? When I was writing about Kurs and I, in Canada, I learned so much about um, how the indigenous groups live here. I see a lot of connection. I can actually see myself as a court more in black literature, indigenous literature, than I can see it in say like Iranian literature. So when there is a chance for us to see those similarity of experiences and find ways where we can turn our pain into art and resistance versus being consumed by pain, that's where we can grow as humans and stop being toddlers, as she pointed out. Um, I, I would like to add to that that um, it basically it is it is true that uh, you cannot ask uh, uh, to literature to be of the official history. Um, I think that would be uh, it won't be it won't be literature because. Uh, um, when we think even about uh, about the literature is basic writing is 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 a form of exploring the world, a form of making sense of the world, and uh, even the idea of a state. I understand what Ava says that it is it is perhaps romantic to think uh, a, 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 a world in which there are no countries. But the fact is that that's what is needed in the sense that a country is basically a border. It is the, uh, the it is the it is the exercise and the monopoly of violence. It it, it demands the, the, the a degree of of uh, loss of, of freedom, and uh, in that sense, uh, at least the. the, the Without going to the extent of uh, of uh, the man in a world with no countries, at least if a dollar can cross a border, so a person should do that too. In that sense, that we won't have these caravans of desperate people from Honduras and Guatemala trying to 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 find some degree of of, of safety crossing the borders, when the very conditions that that people are fleeing are run away are the ones created by by those those borders by those those countries um, i think if it is uh, cortazar also said that the moment uh, literature uh, stops being literature is when it becomes a, a political statement or a political speech i think uh, uh, i uh, once um, a, 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 a nicaraguan uh, a writer came to Montreal and we asked him, uh, seeing what has what was happening in his country, what is literature and writing to do with a situation like that? You know, he was a former um, a member of the government with the Sanistas. His name escapes me now, but uh, uh, he has a book, Margarita Mirando la Mar. And uh, he said that uh, just uh, take note and describe what you see. Yes, um, that is called testimony. And uh, when, when you come from cultures where your language is, uh, is a, it, it, another thing that you realize here is that English, French, and Spanish are colonial languages. So when you come from a country where, where language has been the main tool of oppression, because it is with language that you construct a discourse to oppress and deny the humanity of the other who does not speak the language, or if he, even if he speaks or she speaks the language, you still uh, have the, the monopoly of cultural institutions. So it is the, 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 the testimonial of uh, Domitila Chungara. She was a mining, wife of a miner and she didn't write a book, but she told her story in a book called "If You Allow Me, If I'm Allowed to Speak," or "If You Allow Me to Speak." And uh, I, I agree with uh, with this, with what 
this idea that just uh, don't ask literature to be your political party, but literature can can expand and can help explore other ways of constructing, deconstructing, and reconstructing literature. Um, I think that the the, uh, the uh, challenge for people like us, for the kinds of writers that we are, uh, who come from uh, or are allies of, of oppressed peoples or come from uh, groups of people that have suffered uh, um, violence, violations, uh, repression even, um, is how to balance, right? The, the, um, the, the fine balance between um, uh, what is out there, how we see the world and how it interacts with real people, right? With, with, uh, with the characters that come to embody and to live through those, uh, those atrocities or those hopes or those struggles, right? It's like bringing everything together. That's why literature can be so much more um, approachable and effective in informing or or uh, or um, touching the senses and and the feelings of people, of readers, because uh, our literature gives uh, a name and a face and a life to real people. Because in the end, you know, our fictitious characters are real people. They're composites of of real people out there. And they go through life doing whatever they do, or they uh, or not doing it, or and they, their lives intersect, and their lives also intersect with societal stuff and what's going on and with history. So, yeah, it's 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 important, right, for us who are political writers in many ways to keep that balance to to make sure that we're telling the stories. We're not uh, making statements and we're not uh, educating for the sake of educating, but we're actually telling uh, stories or expressing um, from our bodies and from our minds, um, our feelings, our thoughts, our, our, our ways of uh, seeing the world in our poetry, for example, uh, giving, giving a, putting images into words so that we can um, communicate uh, what's deep inside us and at the same time, what is outside us, right? Yeah, quick note, you have an, a great example in the, in the West Coast in Vancouver with, uh, with Pat Lowther. She wrote this am amazing poem called Chacabuco mm -hmm. and she is this Canadian living in Canada so far away from Chile. And yet just the fact of, of putting names, just saying a name, Chacabuco, she, she brings such a, with such force, a reality that is happening so far away. Mm -hmm. And without being, uh, uh, without being that political, you know, but just by naming, it's already a, a political act. And yeah. as we know, texts always uh, surpass, so, uh, the writer's intention. So mm -hmm. that is what you have in Vancouver. Yeah, and it's because uh, every reader is a different reader, right? And the reader interacts with that text that we as writers may have thought had this, only this kind of reading, but there are as many readings as readers, right? Because they are interacting with, with what uh, we wrote, and for the information of other people, uh, Chacabuco uh, was a notorious concentration camp during the uh, Pinochet dictatorship um, in Chile. I think Ana Marie wanted to say something, no? No? Well, I did, and it's about discomfort too. I think we have to acknowledge that literature has the power to bring us a different kind of discomfort than um, journalistic reporting. When we go into reading a piece of nonfiction 
or reportage, we have a certain frame in mind. We come to it because we want to learn about it. I think that the thing that fiction and poetry can do is to trick people, you know, to think, here, this story is going this way. And to subvert their expectations and to reach people in a different place. I had planned actually to read a different selection from my book, but I just felt an overwhelming urge to read a piece from it that shows an ugly side of what people think, how people talk, the things that happen in the day to day when we're not sitting down together with our best thoughts gathered and our best heart forward, trying to portray what we think is the most important thing to portray. Because dearly as I love that, when I walk out my door into inner city Edmonton, or when I go driving around in Alberta, what I see are a bunch of rednecks who really have deep thoughts and deep connections to the world and the majesty of it, but express themselves in ways that can be um, blunt to the point of toxic if you don't understand your own position. And that's where we live more often than not. So I just want to speak for the power of literature to confront those various uglinesses in the way that people interact and create characters that we don't have to like for them to tell us something we needed to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Ava or Alejandro, anything else before we open uh, the floor for questions? I, I just wanted to uh, build on what my panelists mentioned here, that uh, what makes a story a story of like a simple family dinner, right? Political or non-political, it very much depends on where that family, where that story is set. So for example, um, a t-shirt may not be a very political thing in Canada, right? But a headscarf in Iran is the most political piece of clothing because when the Shah of Iran, the king wanted to make the country look modernized, the first thing he did, he pulled the headscarf out of women's head by force, right? And then after him, this Khomeini shows up and the first thing he wants to do is put it back on women's head by force. Both of these men wanted to portray specific images of themselves, Islamic versus mother, modernist. And no one ever asked women, do you want to have this piece of clothing or not? Or what does it mean to you? So would a piece of clothing as small as a headscarf mean anything? Could it be political or non-political? Really depends on where that is, what is happening around it. So when I talk about activism and politics and literature, I don't expect literature to walk on the street and hold the placards and have slogans and defend the party and ban another party. I'm talking about a piece of literature that admits the reality of life in a place as the Middle East, you know? It's one thing, I love how Anna Maria has talked about a fourth world country. I mean, it's one thing to be from Iran, it's another thing to be a Middle Eastern Kurd. So, when you come from Middle East, when you write about Middle Eastern women, just creating characters that have an apply agency, just having a Middle Eastern woman who does that, that in itself is a political act. Maybe if you create, you know, difficult, different type of characters set in different places, that in itself would not be political. So because I come from a place where my voice has been mutilated really throughout centuries because of my gender and because of my ethnicity specifically, then just me writing in itself as political and is resisting. Um, and that's really all I mean. I would never be able to read a book to the end that tries to teach me something or tries to, you know, educate. I mean, education is one thing, but we're not talking about didacticism or talk, taking you know, the side with one political party versus what. So politics has this really huge meaning and definition. So maybe that's why, uh, just depending on where we are. Uh, in the world right now in the 21st century, because if you are extremely hungry, you're starving, you can't tell a starving person, hey, chocolate is really bad for you. Or, you don't have too much carbohydrate, right? 
<laughs> Whereas if you deal with someone who has had enough food, now you can give them advice about. So I am that starved kid that is asking for that piece of chocolate. And for me, that is, is valuable. And that's something I need right now at this stage. There will hopefully be a day when I'll put the chocolate aside and have vegetables, but not for now. And that's my reality. And just understanding that for me is political. Mm -hmm. uh, before we move on, just uh, a note again from Galliano, um, who back in the 70s said, um, I'm completely aware that uh, I'm writing all of this that I write to uh, to uh, the ten percent of people who will read, who know how to read and write in certain parts of Latin America. Most of the people that I write about, or that I whose stories I've collected and given a, a platform uh, to, um, cannot read or write, uh, or cannot read or write in in Spanish, right? So it's, it's such a bundle of contradictions, right? That we writers uh, walk with and, uh, and, uh, and, and find our ways through to at least uh, add something, right? To put something out there that hopefully will mean something to somebody and will help to create what uh, Anna Marie called the um, you call it the fifth world, right? Where we actually come all together. Or that uh, place that uh, Alejandro talked about where um, borders don't exist because in, in terms of, uh, of uh, stopping people, you know, to, from, uh, from one place to another. Or where nation states uh, do exist, but are open and, and uh, solidary with, with each other. But la, that's um, utopia. And what is utopia good for? Galeano again said, so that we can keep on walking towards it. <laughs> anyway, shall we open uh, the floor for uh, questions from the audience then? Uh, Lily, do we have anything? We have some comments from the authors uh, themselves, but no, no, no questions so far. No question. so, so if anybody wants to just raise their hand, I will be able to see, or if you want to put questions in the, um, in the chat box, I will make sure to relay them. Okay, don't fight over the floor. There will be time for everybody. No, we were so clear, we were so uh, <laughs> fulfilling and <laughs> we expressed ourselves with such clarity that there are no questions. They knew, they understood everything. Anyway, I, Alejandro wants to say something. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a question for Ana Maria. Um, what is uh, we are seeing now that you mentioned that it has become fashionable to to be member of the First Nations uh, and this what happened with this this these women director that uh, uh, took to the screen book by uh, an, uh, uh, by by King the writer uh, in Vancouver in in the festival film of Toronto. Uh, what do you, be, be beyond the, do you think it's just getting access to funds to have a economic benefit that's behind that? Oh boy. Or, is, or something else? No, it's probably about that. We're all trying to make a living. I don't really know, but because I don't know the people involved other than I, I've had the privilege of doing an event with Eden Robinson, who wrote the book on which the film is based. And I, I love her, she's hilarious. But what I've seen in general in these cases is that people are trying to find a way in. They would say for themselves that they do it to honor Indigenous people. And it, it's a really difficult conversation 
And it's been going on for quite a long time and it rages back and forth across various lines. And bottom line has to include people want to live well. Everyone wants to live well. There isn't a person here tonight, or I would wager that I've met anywhere who doesn't in some fundamental way want to live well. Even if they're busy destroying themselves and on a really self-destructive path, they're doing that because they feel deeply frustrated in that drive to live well. So I try to bear that in mind in all of these cases that are going on. Um, and watch and see how people unpack it. It, it needs unpacking, but it's not, it, it, in some ways it's extremely frustrating because it does exacerbate divisions among our communities. And you would think, gosh, shouldn't we just all haul together? We've got enough to do to face up to a world that doesn't really want us to exist in the mainstream anyway. But I don't know, I don't know the answer. Boy, there's a long-winded way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, I got, well, many people commented that they are actually um, out of, of words, and, you know, and thinking about it. Uh, so some comments are that we're still digesting it. Uh, and we was, we were left with a lot to think about. And it has been a thought provoking evening yeah. And so I have this feeling too that we uh, there is all these ideas bouncing and we are trying to keep up with them. Uh, uh, we are Mandeep. Mandeep saying that we are not looking at the questions, but he, uh, he has one question. And the question is, do the writers think that Canada is a perfect country? I think I already know the, the, the answer <laughs> because it, uh, some of you already talked about that, but if anyone wants to take the question. I will say that Mandeep and everyone, Canada is a human country. So that's the best you can say about any country. We're a human country. We get some things right, some things wrong. We, um, to put it in redneck terms, kind of have our head up our ass about how good we are compared to the rest of the world. You froze to again. do some things well. And I have another question. Do you think being able to write in English makes this easier to be heard? Is it easier to make people notice your words and value them? Ava or Alejandro, do you want to? I'll go after Ava. <laughs> if you want. I'm your push, my <laughs> um, So for me, um, I didn't learn Kurdish. My language was Sinai. I didn't learn it growing up. I didn't learn to read in it, to write in it. It was only after I moved to Canada and I started my life in exile that I thought, hold on a second, if I want to say I'm Kurdish, what makes me Kurdish? Is it just because I was born to parents who were themselves assimilated? Or will I be able to claim this identity when I do the extra work of going out of my way to learn my language and my history? So it was in Canada when I learned what it means to be Kurdish and what it means to read out about a channel and all of that. For someone like that, then I had to decide what language I was going to write in. It was so easy for me to write in Farsi. That's the language I had read in my whole life. It was the easiest one for me to do. I had a really good prose um, in that language because of years of reading and writing in it. So for me to change languages, it was, again, really another political act, depending on like how you're looking at politics and how you define it. And for me, um, politics is this huge umbrella term that decide what I wear, the language do I choose, what I write about and all of that. And so I ended up writing in English because I was looking to tell my story to an audience who doesn't know us and doesn't know what, what we are going through and what we need and we need that understanding. And um, this is why I chose 
to write in English. Now that my book has been translated into Kurdish and I am reviewing it, it takes me a surprise so many times how much I would have written a completely different story had I written it in Kurdish. You know, so what language you, you pick and end up writing in it changes what you write. And uh, it was really difficult to be fluent enough in English to write a novel in it. That's why it took me over 10 years, but um, it is this aesthetic uh, distance between you and the language you're employing in order to tell the story makes you slow down, makes you be more careful in choosing the words that you're choosing and gives you a liberty, kind of unchains you from things that your, your mother tongue put in you and you kind of acclimatized to it growing up. So it was a very interesting experience, but I can't deny that had I written the same story in Kurdish, I would have had much fewer audience because this is a language that's dying. Most of the Kurds themselves can't read in it. So I could either write in the language of my direct oppressor or my indirect oppressor. And I decided to choose my master's tool to break down the master's house. I believe uh, Hobio One has a question. I think Alejandro wants to say something about this. Yeah. Yes, I want to, want to speak about languages. And um, um, if, 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 well, Canada as, as a country, so is, if it's, it's, a, it's a, a, the best country, um, I, I don't think that, um, I think we, we better keep uh, that notion of uh, the best country for paradise. Um, in the meantime, we do what we can with what we have. And one of the things that we could do is perhaps to try to, to alter or to, to change this notion of a, a country being a, a bilingual country. If we, you look at, uh, at the biggest cities in the country, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, uh, in Toronto, more than half of the population comes from other parts of the world. So if we would truly want to reflect in literary terms the, 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 the nature, the kind of the, the condition in which the, this country lives and breathes every day, then I don't think we should maintain the idea of being a bilingual country. I think uh, Ava should be able to publish her book in Kurdish in, in Canada. And if, if Canada is prides itself as being a society that could uh, could uh, inspire other societies to not kill each other for uh, us. Um, so perhaps um, we should push forward the idea that uh, there is no, there should not be uh, uh, in terms of literature, I'm not speaking about in terms of legal terms, but in terms of literature, we should, we have to expand the notion of two countries to as many countries as they exist in, in 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 Canada. When you think of the prairies, where you have the biggest number of people of that, that speak Tagalog, or 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 Hindi, or or Gujarati in other parts of the country, or Spanish or, or Arabic, I think these literatures are constrained. I was I was going to read a text about authors that write in other languages, and. Uh, uh, for I, I would say that for for uh, I was uh, I was uh, worried uh, when the time came to become a Canadian. Uh, I didn't want to be, become a Canadian because um, I felt I was I was betraying. And uh, I said I was living in a rooming house in Cotonège, and this African friend said to me, he was a refugee. He said, "What? Well, we, don't be don't be a fool." Become a Canadian, um, but, but I said to him, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll be betraying my homeland, and he said to me, no, 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 you won't be betraying homeland. You have you, you you Bolivia is your mom, and Canada is your wife or your girlfriend, and the same happened with languages, that you can't you can't be loyal to a language. In that sense, I think the more languages we we use, the better. And as for 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 writing in English and French, speaking from Quebec, I do have trouble. It's not easy to find an editor that would want to publish your books written in three languages. 
and uh, they said to me, you know, it would be better if you do it only English and Spanish or French and Spanish or French and English, but not English, French and Spanish. And I said, I said no, because uh, the, the politics in this part of the country is that you are either English or French, Anglophone, Francophone, Wallophone. But what happens when you live in three languages daily, you know, and this ultimately is is a, is a is a strategy to keep us divided, but also to neutralize other languages. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it is um, it is uh, uh, there was a, a an, an Algerian uh, poet that was asked once, why does he write in French? Because his language is Ar Arabic. I said I write in French because um, uh, les Français est, 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 une, est une prisonnière de guerre. So it was my prisoner of war that in the struggle of independence, he would keep his Arab, Arabic language as writing, but he would also take the language of the colonial power as a prisonnier de guerre. So I, I don't, it's not the same, but it's also another reflection about the use of languages. I, I came to Quebec because I didn't want to live in English. But at the end, when you are young and naive, you don't want the language of the empire. But, but it, Engels wrote his books in English, well, in German, then in English, you know, and he studied, he lived in England. And uh, so it is a great tool to, you have to understand the devil. What language does he speak? <laughs> claro, we all know that the devil speaks every language. But the question is, what do you do when you live in your own homeland and your mother tongue has been ripped from its roots? Yeah. Tell me who can edit a work in Anishinaabe Moin mm -hmm. or in Mi'kmaq? Who can? If I were to give you a work in those languages, could you read it? Could you comment on the symbology? I couldn't even write it because I wasn't taught those languages. I'm learning them as an adult, but the languages I am learning are not the high languages, are not the most fulsome language that only comes when you have an international body of speakers who are large enough to incorporate richness, but I know it's there. And I find it fascinating to be able to move from English towards a reconnection with those languages because it teaches me something. And one thing about languages, I was taught that in Mi'kmaq we have a word for monkey. And if you think about that for a minute, Mi'kmaq is what we call Atlantic Canada, right? It's New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, Abigwe, known as Prince Edward Island, Quebec, down into Vermont and Maine, that's Mi'kmaq. We have a word for monkey. Why? Because we are related to the people where the monkeys live. And we traveled down there and we traded down there. So when you learn these things, it opens, a one word opened up such excitement in me as a writer to know that the stories that we have held on to in the time when our stories were illegal in the time when our languages were illegal. And that's in my lifetime, I'm not that old. Those stories and those languages in this very land hold the key to the knowing that we have always had a connection from the land of the condor to the land of the eagle. And that there's a prophecy about that too, that when the eagle and the condor fly together. Yeah. Maybe we're the chickens. Alejandra. Uh -huh. Do we have any other questions, uh, Lily? No? No, we have several people saying how much they, they enjoyed it. it. This has been wonderful. Um, uh, thanks so much for this wonderful event. Thanks so much for the interesting thoughts and comments. It's been such an interesting talk. Thank you very much for sharing your work and points of view. Um, yes, and that's it. 
Well, before we go, I would like to acknowledge um, Hugh Hazelton, <laughs> who's uh, being part of this uh, audience. Um, Hugh Ugo has been a key person in the uh, in in what Hugh in the translation and in in the uh, getting the Latin American writers in Canada uh, to publish and to be known. And uh, he's also written uh, critical studies about our work, which ha uh, have put us on the map. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for me to thank Hugo Hugh Hazelton for all the work he has done um, as a true ally, as a true ally. Mm -hmm. Gracias, Hugo. <laughs> and I would also. Huh? You can see just a minute. I would like to just also to acknowledge Hugh Hazelton because he was, uh, <laughs> when I was writing, the, when the novel was written, uh, it had been in my, in my drawer for, for a while. And um, uh, the fact is, if I had the chance to be published, it was because of friends like Hugh, because uh, otherwise the, 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 the manuscript of uh, red, yellow and green will still be in my drawer. Uh, he has also um, helped me to publish Lettre de Nutka and also the red, yellow and green in Spanish way in the nineties. And he was, uh, uh, he is a strong, strong supporter of, uh, of Spanish uh, writing in Canada. And I think that without his work, we'll still be lost uh, in, uh, somewhere with our texts sleeping, the sleep of the indifference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hugh. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would like to thank Hugo está hablando. A Hugo, dale. Hey, bueno, it, it's been a pleasure to, to listen to the, uh, the three authors tonight. Uh, fantastic, really. Um, and um, when I think of, you know, the, the indigenous uh, languages here, and then a Kurdish, and then uh, Spanish, Aymara, Quechua, uh, I mean, it makes such a wonderful combination. <laughs> that uh, uh, really uh, it's uh, it's been thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable for me and I've learned a lot. Good. Thanks to you all. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, to everybody who attended and um, lasted all this long <laughs> listening to us. And thank you, Lily and Vilak for sponsoring and organizing. Uh, and of course, thank you to my three friends, Alejandro, Anna Marie, and Ava for uh, taking up the challenge and for being here tonight, sharing with us their very provocative and insightful views on all of these things that we do create right and for being uh, true uh, messengers of the notion that to write is to resist and to write is to recreate. Thank you, everybody. Buenas Thank noches. you, Carmen. Buenas Thank noches. you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Good night. Bonsoir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Adios. Ciao. Gracias, Carmen. Gracias. Bye-bye. Gracias, Adios. Gracias a todos. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Gracias, Carmen. Obrigado. Gracias. Buenas noches. Buenas noches.